I try to have the pastor prove it, I have to do it with that. I remember our talents, man. Everything for the Lord. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. God is good, remember faith? And all the time. God is so remember the first time here that we just want to welcome you all look so red to this evening. You look so very beautiful. Anybody, is this your first time? Cody. Cody. Oh, Cody, yeah, this is your first time here. Cody. Welcome to the Cody. Well, they also help us out in our server and invite to listen the last couple of days. So thanks, man. Appreciate it. Let's get to it. Let's see our Bibles, River Faith Church. I know you still have a party to do tonight. Are you? Oh, this is all the party we're going to get. We're going to party with Jesus. Can you hear an amen? Amen. Let's start our Bibles to the book of John, chapter 19. And we are finishing our series called Christ the King. Say, Christ the King. Christ and in this series, we study what kind of king Christ is. And we understand that all the things that we've learned so far, Christ is a totally different king. Let's all bow our heads and let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for this great opportunity to study your word. We pray, Lord, that as we conclude this series, that will be for, forever embedded in our hearts, Lord, what it means that Jesus is our king. And not only is our King, it's also our Savior. It's also our Lord. And the ultimate example of humility and kindness, compassion, love, and grace that is set before us. We pray, Lord, that we be forever, Lord God, reminded that this is the God that we serve. That we serve a humble King, but yet powerful and the true King of kings and the Lord of Lords. May be with us now, Lord, as we pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone says, Amen. The newborn king has been ignored by his people. We learned that. What is a king doing in the manger? The three wise men were all, well, it's not really three, but tradition says there's three wise men. But the wise men were looking, they're expecting the people are also looking for the newborn king, but nobody was looking. The newborn king has been ignored by his own people. There was no room in the inn, and the king was born in a stinky, muggy, wet cave called Manger. When the Father has bestowed upon him all authority over everything, he still expresses love by washing the feet of his disciples. When it was time for his coronation, he was given a crown of thorns and a robe to mock him. By now we can see that Jesus was no ordinary king. He was the Savior King. And as we conclude tonight, the title of our sermon is Christ the Savior King. As we all know, a king is the service of crown of his royalty. But everything that we studied so far in this series tells us the exact opposite of what Christ is as a king. Kings are born in palaces. Jesus Christ was born in the manger. When a newborn king is announced, people are expecting him. When Jesus was born, nobody was looking for him. A king is worthy of a blink. Say blink. Bling. Say bling bling. We all love bling bling. A king is worthy of a crown adorned by precious stones. But what kind of crown did Jesus receive? A crown of thorns. A king deserves a robe of royalty. But they put a robe on him to mock him. And now Jesus will show us the full extent of his love. That though he was born to be the king of the Jews. He took the part of a slave. So he can ransom us from our sins. Let's turn our Bibles. John chapter 19. Verse 17. John chapter 19, verse 17. Say amen if you're there. Amen. I told you to start from verse 15. 
John 19, verse 15. It says here, Pontius Pilate speaking, it says, So what? Crucify your king? Pilate asked. And then the people replied to him and said, We have no king but Caesar. The leading priest shouted back, Then Pilate turned Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus away, carrying the cross by himself. He went to the place called the place of the skull, which is in Hebrew, Golgotha. Say Golgotha. Golgotha. I'm losing my voice. There they nailed him to the cross. Two others were crucified with him, one on either side, with Jesus between them. And Pilate posted a sign, say sign, sign. on the cross that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek, so that many people could read it. Then the leading priest objected and said to Pilate, Change it from the king of the Jews to he said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate replied, No. What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they divided his clothes among the four of them. They also took his robe, but it was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said, Rather than tearing it apart, let's throw a dice for it. And the Bible says this fulfilled the scripture that says they divided my garments among themselves and threw dice for my clothing so that it was they. It was what they did. Number one in our notes this evening, if there is a greatest expression of what Christmas should be about, the cross should be the ultimate expression of Christmas. But if you look around us today, if you look in our surrounding today, you will barely see a house, better off a wall, that is displaying a cross or something that relates to Christ. And it just reminds us on how much we commercialize Christmas. It just reminds us of the world that we live in today on how far we have forgotten on what Christmas is really about. To the point that we even attempting to say, don't use the word Christmas anymore, just say holiday. Just say holiday tree. Or just greet people happy holidays. It's not Christmas anymore. It's not a spiritual thing anymore. It's just a people where people celebrate, or it's just an event where people celebrate, give gifts, wear red or green. And this is how far we have gone from where Christmas is really about. If there is a great expression of what Christmas is, it should be the cross. Can I hear an amen? Why? Because we cannot deny that it was because of the cross. That's why the believers of Jesus Christ are free today from sin. It was because of the cross that's why the believers of Christ are free today to worship Him. It was because of the cross. That's why the song says, Good news. Say good news. Good news. Tell the person next to you, say good news. Good say there's some ham and pot rolls later. Good news. That's why the song says, Pastor J was singing, Good news, do not be afraid. The angel says, I bring good news that the people will all rejoice for. What is that good news? If you put your faith on what Christ has done on the cross, you are free. Your sins have been forgiven. Can I hear that, amen? Yeah. Can we give a hand to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? This evening? If Jesus is truly the only reason for this season, then we cannot overlook the fact that what he did on the cross is the ultimate expression of his love. 
I know how commercialized our Christmas is now here in the United States. Maybe even in, in other parts of the world. We understand that. We live in this world and we cannot say and we cannot be, you know, we cannot tell other people, although I, I see it differently. No, we all do. Because we live in this world, we live in this culture. And yes, we are all guilty of that. But I hope that every Christmas, not only every Christmas, but that message can still remind us that as we celebrate tonight or as we celebrate tomorrow, as we give and as we receive, let's set apart the cross in our hearts. Can I hear an amen? Let us be reminded, despite of all the glamour, the fun, the excitement, the spirit, the feeling in the air of Christmas, let us all be reminded that if you are a believer of Christ, this is what makes it personal to you. What Christ did on the cross. For us believers of Jesus Christ, this is where it gets personal. This is where we know that when we celebrate Christmas, we feel something different other than just joy and excitement. We feel something personal because we understand that it is the life of our Savior. It is the life, the person of Jesus Christ who we are celebrating and not just the date. It's not just because it says it's December 24 and it says December 25, that's why we're here today. No, we understand that we are celebrating not the date. People argue, we don't, you don't even know when it's really the day Jesus Christ was born. That's right. But we are not celebrating the date. We are celebrating the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Can I hear an amen? amen. Let's give it up to our God this evening. This is how we celebrate. We commemorate. We remember. We reflect on what the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, has done for us. A person who truly understands what Jesus did on the cross for him or her will have an ultimately different view and different way to celebrate Christmas. Remember on Christmas Day, it is not the date we are celebrating. It is the person of Jesus Christ. Can I hear an amen? amen. Number two in our notes. It says here that Jesus was born a king. He died a king. The only difference is the people did not acknowledge him as one. We cannot overlook and we cannot ignore the fact that even the testimony of the people mentioned in the scriptures are very strong. How can you say that Jesus never claimed to be a king if the wise men who were looking for him even says, where is the newborn king of the Jews? And that was when he was born. And when he was about to die, Pontius Pilate, who interrogated him, and multiple times said that I find nothing wrong with this man, mentioned that he is a king. Amen. He told the people, here is your king, you want me to crucify your king? And not only that, he even made a sign himself, according to the scriptures we read tonight. He made a sign, not only in one language, but in three different languages, in Hebrew, in Greek, and in Latin, that says, King of the Jews. That's why the Pharisees are complaining. Don't say that. We did never acknowledge him as King of the Jews. But Pontius Pilate says, I already wrote it. You know, Jesus is the only king I know that you have a choice to reject him or not. Can I hear an amen? As far as I know, when you're born into a kingdom or when you're part of a kingdom, you have no say of who the king is. Can I hear that, man? There are still nations today that's still ruled by a king. And guess what? If you're born in that nation, you don't get to pick. Because kings are passed on to their what? To the next of kin. To the family, to the royal bloodline. That means people have no choice. It's not like here you can vote or we want to be a president. 
But you know what? Jesus is the only king I know that people has the power to say, no, not for me. I don't celebrate Christmas. Oh, yeah, yeah, I do. Well, I don't. Well, I do. Well, I don't. And that's just the beauty of it. Because the Bible tells us that God never forces himself to you and never says, oh, you've got to believe in me. Jesus paid a price. He walked with humility, with love, with compassion. And some people say, oh, I don't really believe in that. I don't really believe in the Bible. And here's just my argument. What do you have to lose? I got in a conversation one time with a person that I'm witnessing to and oh no, I don't believe in the Bible, I don't believe in all this, I don't believe in the Christ exists and all this. And I'm like, okay. You probably grew up in a different thing that your mind, for some reason, you don't believe in all of this. But here's just my question. What do you have to do? The Bible teaches for you to love, forgive, be faithful to our God that loves you. That you are forgiven, that you don't have to do it by yourself anymore. That you are loved. What do you have to lose? So what if all of this is not really true? You ain't got nothing to look at here, amen? amen? You live a life that God wants you to live. To show kindness, compassion. Forgive. Love. Let go. What do you have to lose? I don't see it. But yet still, many refuse to acknowledge Jesus as a king. Although the testimonies are very strong. Look at what it says in 1 Corinthians 1.18. The message of the cross is what? The message of the cross is what? The message of the cross is what? For those who are headed for what? But for those who are being saved, they know it is the what? Oh, there are people that are going to come across and you tell them about the story of Jesus Christ and for them it's foolishness. It's rubbish. I want to do it in an English accent, but I can't. <laughs> rubbish. It's foolishness. When people say, you believe in this? I don't believe in that. Bible story says those who are headed for destruction, meaning they don't really want to believe, is foolishness for them. But for those who believe in God, it is the what? It is the what? It is the what? It is our power. We know that we have been saved because we have heard the good news and we have confessed that Jesus is the Lord and believe in our hearts that we rose and died again. So how can this thing be foolish? Yes, it can be foolish. The message of Christmas. People say it's about Jesus. It is foolish. Yes, but for those who are headed for destruction. But for those who believe in our Lord and Savior in Jesus Christ. To say, it is the power that I have in me. Can I hear the name of the power I have in me. It never fails to amaze me when we go out there and we tell them it's free. We're doing this for free. And people are like wondering, well, why are you doing this for free? It's cold out here. You're, you're wrapping gifts. You know, people wrapping gifts at the mall. They're making a lot of money. You really don't want to accept donations and all this. It's free. And for them, it's like, man, this sounds like too good to be true. It's not. That's how the God of love is. It's so good to be true. Despite of all the things that we have done, the things that we are not proud of, can I hear an amen? All the nasties in our life, despite of all that junk, the Bible tells us that God loves us. That's why some people say, man, that's foolishness. It's not. It's foolishness to you because you do not believe. It's foolishness to you because your heart is hardened. It's foolishness to you because you're stubborn. It's foolishness to you because the Bible says you're stiff necked. Have you ever heard that from the Bible that God called his people, you stiff necked people? My wife, I picked up my wife yesterday, she has a stiff neck. 
And it just reminded me. She was crying because she couldn't really move it. What is the point sometimes that's how close-minded people are? It's foolishness. I don't want this. How could you not want love? How could you not want freedom? How could you not want forgiveness? How could you not want relationship with a humble king? How could you not want that? Can I hear that? Amen. Lastly, we close with this. Luke 23, 39 to 43. The Bible says that Jesus was hung with two criminals. It was a custom to them when they crucified, they crucified in front of many people. The Bible says that he was no sin, became sin for us. Curse is a man who is hung on a tree. Many scholars believe that Jesus died not only a horrible death, but a shameful death. There's a very good ch chance that he, he died naked. For they took away their clothes, his clothes. Actually, the scripture warns us about that. And it says that they will divide his clothes and cast them for lots. Why did the Bible say that? Because those are the signs that this is the Messiah. Those are the signs that the prophets say, how could you miss that? These are the signs. No bones will, will be broken in him. And truly, no bone, bones were broken. The two of the, the, two of the criminals, their, their, their legs were broken, but Jesus died, is dead already, so they just pierced him on the side. And no bones were broken, just as what the Bible says. The Bible says that they will offer him sour vinegar and wine. And that's, guess what? When Jesus says, I was thirsty, guess what they offered him? The Bible says that they will divide him clothes. They will cast lots. They will play dice for his clothes. And guess what happened? The Bible says, duh, these are the signs. These are, these are the prophetic signs that this is the Messiah. But people keep ignoring and ignoring. Oh, no, it's not. Jesus, no, it's, it's not the Messiah. How can we miss that? Lastly, we'll close with this. Look at what it says here. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. Say scoffed. Scoff. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself. And look what it says here. And us too while you're at it. <laughs> you know, good thing we know Jesus really does. Can you hear that? Because if I was Jesus, man, I would just take your one nail and just smack you outside your head. You're mocking me and then you're telling me you want me to save you? Heck no! Look what it says. So you're the Messiah, are you proven by saving yourself and us too while you're at it? But the other criminal protested. Don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes. But this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said to Jesus. Again, there were two of them. One of them was smart out. And telling Jesus, oh, you're the Messiah? Okay, show it to us. But the other one recognizes something in Jesus. And look what it says here. It says, we deserve to die for our crimes, but this man has done anything wrong. Then he said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your what? Kingdom. When you come into your what? Kingdom. When you come into your what? Kingdom. Hallelujah! The first person who actually acknowledged that Jesus has a kingdom and therefore is a king. You got to understand that when Jesus was presented to his people with a crown of thorns and a robe, which is his coronation, his presentation, the people hasn't stopped saying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And while he was walking in the cross, they were mocking him. They were making fun of him. So as soon as when Jesus was presented in front of his people, none of them recognize the king as the king. Not of them. Recognize him as the king. And guess what? Just few minutes or, not, or even hours before Jesus Christ is going to die. 
Finally, the first person. Finally, the first person. Finally, recognize him. Jesus. Remember me when you go through it. Jesus, remember me. You know, the Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, if you repent from your sin, you will be saved. This man didn't even have time for that. He didn't even have time to say, Jesus, these are all my sins. As you can see, I'm all messed up here right now because of my sins. Let me tell you about my testimony. Let me tell you about my background, what got me here, what I've done, and let me tell you all these things. He didn't even have that time to do that. The only thing he had time to do is say, I know that you are a king. Please just remember me when you enter your kingdom. Just remember me. He didn't even say, save me. There's still time. You can still take out the nails on your cross and, you know, just turn these people into monkeys or whatever you want to do. There's still time. He didn't even say that. He didn't even say, save me. He didn't even say, forgive me. He just said, Lord, remember me. When you come into your kingdom. And look at Jesus' reply. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today, you will be with me. Hallelujah. Lastly, in our notes, one of the criminals became the first to acknowledge Jesus as the Savior King. It was the first, but definitely not the last. You know, I call this criminal the early bird. I call him the early bird. You know, during Christmas time, all these malls has this promo of the early bird special. Some of you laughing because you were doing like, you're an early bird. What is an early bird? Early bird catches the herb the what the freshest warm. That means if you're the earliest there you get all the sale. While the world is busy about early sale and discounts and all this. Let us be reminded of this man tonight. The first, the early bird. The first to say, Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you go to your kingdom. And Jesus replied to me, welcome to early bird special. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Amen. Amen. Let's give a hand to our God this evening. As we give and receive on Christmas Day, let us be reminded that the greatest gift the world has ever known was actually opened 2,000 years ago. That's right. His name was Jesus. Oh. His name was Jesus, our King, my King, I hope yours too. Yes, I Let's give a hand to our King. Yes. I came to know the Lord September 18, 2004. Ever since then, Christmas morning has had a whole new different feeling for me. I always love Christmas. I always love Christmas, special with those things. Nothing beats that. This is the early morning. You know, and my, of course my parents fold me of hanging a sock. <laughs> and early in the morning you wake up and you know something is there. <laughs> Sorry the kids are here. <laughs> I always love Christmas. There's just something, the feeling that's just out of this world. But ever since ever since 2004, September 2004, 
Christmas has always been a different thing. Christmas, I'm reminded why I'm here. This part, Christmas has reminded me that I'm not alone. Christmas has reminded me that I'm only here because I'm forgiven by the grace and love of our Savior, Hallelujah. Jesus Christ. Yes. That is the meaning of Christmas. That is the greatest gift we could ever receive on Christmas Day. Merry Christmas to you, River Faith Church. Let's celebrate Christ-centered Christmas this year. Can I hear an amen? Let's give a hand for the praise of God. Let's say Jesus!